video we're going to introduce kinetics chapter 12. Kinetics is looking at how fast a reaction is occurring. So we're looking at rates. And how do we measure rate? We can either look at how much product is made over time or how much reactant is used up over time. And the amounts of reactant and product is typically measured in concentration. So when we're looking at rates, the units of rate of reaction is typically molarity per second, a unit of concentration per time. Why is this important? Because in industry, often you want to create as much product as possible in as least amount of time as possible. We want to maximize product, minimize time. So let's start looking at factors that might affect the rate of reaction. We usually want to increase the rate, so let's think of how we can do that. Before we do that, we have to look at collision theory. Collision theory, as it sounds, is that reactant particles must collide in order to react. So if I have a reaction between NO and O3, they have to collide with each other in order to change into new products. Not every single collision will result in a reaction because you have to have the right amount of energy. You need enough energy to overcome the activation energy and enough energy to break the bonds. Um, and you also have to collide in the correct orientation. There might be new bonds that have to be made, some bonds that have to be broken. The right orientation, um, the right alignment between particles is essential. So if a collision does not meet these requirements, uh, you might have particles colliding, but no reaction actually occurs. So really only a fraction of collisions are effective collisions. So any way we can increase the number of collisions and also increase the number of effective collisions, we can increase the rate of reaction. So let's start thinking about some factors. What do you think about temperature? And what do you think about particle size? What would increase the number of collisions? So typically a higher temperature and a smaller particle size given the same mass will increase the rate and let's look at why. Well what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy. So if I increase temperature, particles are moving faster so they will collide more often and thus they will increase the number of collisions. Also at a higher temperature, the reactants themselves have more energy. They have higher kinetic energy. That's the definition of temperature. So more particles will also um, be able to do more effective collisions. They'll be able to overcome the activation energy needed. So not only do you have more collisions, you also have more effective collisions. If I look at particle size, anytime I have increased contact between my reactants, I'll have more collisions. So if I look at these two solids, same solid, essentially the same mass, but broken up in a different way. Here I have one big piece. And if this is my other reactant, notice there's only limited contact it can make. I have all this area inside that's hidden from the other reactant, so it's not currently reacting. Whereas if I break it up into smaller pieces, I now have increased areas of contact between the two reactants. So the smaller particle size, given the same mass, will actually react faster. And how can I get the smallest pieces? I can make it a powder. So powders are always going to react faster than larger pieces. Smaller particle size increases the area available to react, which we call the surface area. So by making the particle size smaller, we're making the surface area bigger, and that's why it reacts faster. Okay, so anytime the surface area of the solid is increased, the reaction would happen faster. Another way, um, if I have a solution, if I have a, a mixture, I should say, and it's homogeneous, the mixture will react faster because, again, I've increased the areas of contact. If the, two, um, if the two substances can mix evenly in with each other, that would react faster than something heterogeneous where I have two distinct phases and they won't mix in evenly. Concentration of reactants is another factor. How do we measure concentration? Remember, we, we measure concentration with molarity, which is moles of solute over liters of solution. So let's look at an example. Here's A and here's B. They have the exact same volume, but different numbers of molecules or different moles. So if in, in A, I have less moles for the same volume, so I have a lower concentration. In B, I have a higher concentration. Which do you think would react faster? Essentially, which one would have more collisions? Well, B would have more collisions because I have more particles, and there'd be obviously more, more chances of them colliding. Okay, so we can achieve a faster rate by increasing the concentration of reactant. 
Again, increasing the reaction, the concentration of products wouldn't have this effect because they've already reacted. So it has to be of reactants. Another factor to look at is pressure. Let's talk about pressure and volume and for a gas. When pressure goes up, volume goes down. That's an inverse relationship. Okay, so let's consider two scenarios. Here I have a larger volume, here I have a smaller volume for the same number of particles. Okay, this would have a lower pressure, this would have a higher pressure. Which one would have more collisions? Well, this one on the right would have more collisions because the particles would come in contact with each other more often. So again, we're kind of increasing particle contact. Um, it also has a higher concentration because it has the higher pressure. I've essentially lowered my volume for the same number of moles, so that has increased my molarity. So if you look at it for a gas, really by increasing the pressure, you're increasing the concentration of the reactant, which goes by the last rule that we just talked about. So we can actually achieve more collisions in a faster rate by increasing the pressure if I have a gaseous reactant. This also by proxy increases the concentration. So this is for a gas because this PVNRT relationship, this only applies for gases. What about a liquid or even a solid? Okay, Here I have two containers um, and here I'm applying a pressure to one and here I'm not. Okay, here's lower pressure, here's higher pressure. Uh, did I really change anything in terms of particle spacing? Well, for a liquid, liquids are essentially already compressed together. The, the liquid particles are very close to each other. Um, by pressing on it, I'm not making them go any closer to each other. So the concentration really stays the same, so I have the same number of collisions. Um, so what's really going to have, the, the takeaway here is that pressure only affects the rate of a reaction for gas reactants. It has absolutely no effect on solids or liquids. There are particles are already um, very close together, so compressing it um, would really have no effect. Okay, a, a last thing you could do here too is adding a catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that is not um, permanently changed or consumed by the chemical reaction, but it does help the reaction to go faster. It essentially gives it a different pathway, which we'll investigate a little bit more later. Enzymes are examples of this. The catalytic converter in your car is an example for it. A lot of times it gives um, the two reactants a place to bond onto where they can then come into contact with each other and then it, the catalyst releases those reactants so it's not permanently being changed in any way. Okay. Um, let's investigate rates of reaction a little bit further. Well, how do you measure a rate of reaction? Again, what you would do is you would take, um, over, over time, you would take concentration, you would measure the concentration of a reactant or maybe a product over time. Um, so here you can see a chart different times. Here's the concentration of this particular reactant. You'll notice that it's going down over time because it's a reactant, which makes sense. If it were a product being measured, these numbers would get bigger over time because products are made over time. Okay. Um, you could get the average rate by taking the change in concentration over the change in time for these intervals. So what I'm doing is I'm just taking the change in the concentration, remember these square brackets mean concentration or molarity, over the change in time. Um, what the convention is, why am I have this negative sign here? Um, the convention is to always keep the rate positive. So since I'm measuring a reactant, which is going down over time, um, I'm essentially flipping them to make it a positive uh, number. So that's why I put this negative sign here. The change in concentration over time, if it's a reactant, I'm going to put a negative there to flip the rate to being positive. Okay. So here again, notice the average rate is written as a positive number. And if I look at my units, the units are molarity per second. Notice that the average rate over time is decreasing. Does that make sense? That does make sense because as the reaction goes forward, I'm using up reactants, so there's less reactants, so there will be fewer collisions. Makes sense. So over time, the reaction rate typically slows. It's the greatest at the start of the reaction. Okay. Um, you could also plot um, concentration versus time, and it would yield something that looks like this. Notice the rate is largest in the beginning and starts to almost start to flatten over time. You can, using a graph, you can also get what's called the instantaneous rate, the rate at any instant, um, by, by essentially taking the slope of a tangent to the curve at that point. So, um, for instance, 
Um, and this is different than average rate. So from here on in, if you hear the term rate, that refers to instantaneous rate. So for instance, that t equals 600 seconds, here's my 600 seconds point. I would make a tangent line um, that touches at 600 seconds. And then I can measure the change in concentration over change in time of that tangent line. And I can get the rate at that instant. Okay, so for this one, change in concentration over change in time, and I put a negative sign just so that I can get a positive answer. And if I estimate um, here and here, I could say, okay, the concentration goes from about 0.042 down to about 0.018, and the change in time is 400 to 800, and then I can get an actual number here. I can say, okay, the instantaneous rate is about 6 times 10 to the negative 5th molarity per second. I can do that at any point along the graph. If I do that at the beginning at time equals zero, we can call that the initial rate. And this is usually the initial rate is going to kind of give us the best indicator of how fast this reaction can go because we know reactions will slow over time as the product builds up. Okay, in this reaction, notice my stoichiometry is 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, so it didn't ma matter which thing I'm measuring the concentration of over time, I'm going to get the same answer for my rate. Okay, the disappearance of C4H9Cl is the same as the appearance of this product here, which would be the same as the appearance of HCl because it's 1 to 1 to 1. Now, what if I have a stoichiometry where the ratio is not 1 to 1? So look at this reaction here. Um, notice for every one mole of O2, I'd have four times as many NO2 molecules appearing. And I'd also have um, two times as many N2O5s being used up. So to make the reaction rate equivalent, no matter which species I'm measuring, we can record changes in concentration, and we can multiply by the inverse of their stoichiometric proportions. What does that mean? So for instance, I can measure the rate as the change in O2 over the change in time. Or instead of looking at O2, if I want to make it equivalent, I can measure the change of NO2 over time, but I'd have to take one-fourth of it because there'd be four times as many O2s, uh, NO2s as O2s. I'm multiplying by the inverse of the coefficient to make these things equivalent. Or I could have measured the concentration of N2O5 over time, but then I'd have to multiply by a half and flip the sign because N2O5 would be decreasing, multiply by negative one half. Okay? Again, notice the negative sign on a reactant because the reactant's disappearing and I want to work with a positive rate. So to generalize, the takeaway is um, for a reaction, all I'm doing is I'm measuring the change in concentration of that thing over the change in time, and I can multiply by 1 over the coefficient and put a negative sign if it's a reactant being used up, keep a positive sign if it's a product being made. You're kind of thinking about it as how can I manipulate it so that the coefficients are canceled out so that it doesn't matter which species is being an analyzed, I'll get the same answer for my rate. Take a moment and try this example, and then we'll go over it. A is just looking for a general rate expression. So I'm just kind of using this general expression that I did before. I can say that the rate, if I'm doing in terms of O3, okay, here's my change in O3 over change in time. I'm putting 1 over the coefficient, and I want a negative sign to keep the rate positive because O3 is a reactant and be using up over time. And I can relate this to O2 by doing change in O2 over change in time, but taking one-third of it, one over the coefficient. I don't need a negative sign because it's a product. It's being made, so the rate would then be positive by measuring the change over time. You can also think of this, if you'd rather, as kind of like stoichiometry. What would I have to, if I'm starting with the concentration of O3 over the change in time, and I'm going to put a negative sign because it's a reactant it's being used up, what would I have to multiply this by um, so that this changes into O2 over time? What would I have to multiply this by? Um, and I can think of it as the, the stoichiometry. For every three O2s, there's two O3s. So essentially, I would have to take this starting amount of O3 um, over change in time, and I'd have to multiply it by a negative 3 halves in order for it to be equivalent to the change in O2 over change in time. So you can think of it like that in kind of a logical stoichiometry kind of terms, or you can just kind of remember this general statement, that this general expression that I showed before.
okay it's up to you um, I don't see this qu kind of question asked that much anymore on the AP though it could be so this is still something that you want to know um, B is just applying this to a situation where they give you the rate so for B now that I have, if you look at this, now that I have my general expression, all I have to do is plug in for the change in O2 over change in time, plug in 6 times 10 to the negative 5, and I can solve for what the change in O3 over change in time is. So if I plug in, okay, it's that same expression, except I'm plugging in for the change in O2 over change in time. I can move this negative 1 half to the other side. So I'm doing this number divided by 3 times 2 okay and I end up getting um, 4 times 10 to the negative fifth instead you can again you can also think of this in terms of stoichiometry I can start with this number and add unit more units to it so this is 6 times 10 to the negative fifth molarity of O2 over time how can I change this into the molarity of O3 over time instead well I want molarity of O2's to cancel out so how can I relate molarity of O3 to molarity of O2 oh, that's just stoichiometry for every two O3's there's three O2's and so all I'm doing is 6 times 10 to the negative fifth times two divided by three and I get that same answer so you can also think of this in terms of stoichiometry so that's the beginning of chapter 12 the intro and we will look at the rest of it in class